Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our second, unfortunately, uh, special drought episode of our Badger Crop Connect web webinar series. I am Natasha Paris, the Regional Crop Educator for Green Lake, Marquette, Washera, and Adams Counties, and I will be your host today. Um, <clears throat> Just to get us started, uh, I wanted to show us a couple pictures of drought. I'm sure most of us have are familiar with the concept because that's why we're all here. But um, you know, the 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 feature picture for today, you can see uh, the corn is pineappling, as we call it, and then we have a few other pictures uh, from around the state of uh, corn that's either pineappling, uh, just stunted, or firing. So. Um, to get us started, I wanted to uh, let you know that we're going to have several speakers. They're going to be short 10 minute presentations. We will have opportunities to ask questions. You can place them in the chat. Uh, today, our helpers for the chat are going to be uh, Sam Bibby. And uh, if you need to email him with any technical uh, issues, or if you have uh, if you need help getting into the Zoom, you can uh, contact him. He will put his information in the chat. Uh, UW-Madison is a recipient of uh, federal funding and as is Extension as a division of, uh, of UW-Madison. And as part of your registration for this webinar today, you were asked to complete your demographic information so that we can ensure that we are uh, reaching um, a, an aud a broad audience. Thank you for providing that information. Just a bit of housekeeping, most of you are familiar with Zoom already. However, here is a quick reminder on how to use uh, the Zoom functions. We ask that you keep yourself muted and your video off throughout the webinar uh, to, in, to make sure we have everyone has a good experience and to uh, reduce the amount of bandwidth being used. So if you have, again, if you have any questions or technical difficulties, please contact Sam Bibby. With that, I will have us, we are going to get started. Today's first speaker is uh, Joe Lauer, uh, who is our uh, extension specialist in corn agronomy, and he will be talking to us about uh, the state of things in corn. All right, thank you, Natasha. I gotta make sure my slide works here, there we go. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> I thought I'd uh, start uh, this talk a little bit about whether or not we're still in a flash drought. I don't know exactly the definition of a flash drought, but it seems like it's been ongoing for a long time, and um, maybe we're maybe we're at drought status now. I'm not sure. Uh, this past week, I hosted a group of um, Australian farmers and consultants and uh, and uh, industry people and. Uh, I told them we were in the middle of an extreme drought. And as we were walking through our corn plots, they were just amazed that this was a drought and, and, uh, and now an extreme drought and, and uh, that the corn was uh, looking this good. And, and if you go around like the uh, many, many fields around Arlington, even though we're in extreme drought, uh, we still have some just excellent looking crops at this point. Uh, of course, we're in the middle of, um, pollination and, and things remain to be seen as to what we can expect later on. But but um, what I wanted to do today was just quickly kind of review um, just a couple of weather slides, things that I do that kind of track the history of some of this, uh, of, of uh, these weather changes. And then second, I wanted to just talk about what the crop is going through and how we need to think about managing this. Um, the, uh, uh, this is the uh, drought map that of course came out yesterday. And you can see that uh, this part of Wisconsin in the southern half and west, southwestern half is under extreme drought. We're now seeing some extreme drought in the northern part of the state as well around Superior. And this is quite a change from what we saw three weeks ago uh, when just really Dane County and Sauk County was uh, primarily affected the drought uh, ha, the drought monitor has expanded the uh, amount of extremely drought area, and um, and uh, so it is kind of expanding at this point. If you look at the 
uh, kind of the over the last 30 years from April 1st until yesterday, uh, this is what our GDU accumulation has been. Again, the normal is this green line right here. And this would be uh, years that were warmer than normal and years that were cooler than normal up to July 27th. And you can kind of see how they ended up. But here's where we're at for this year in 2023 at Arlington. We're basically a little bit above normal, but not all that, not all that bad in terms of in terms of GDU accumulation or temperatures. Where we're really uh, suffering, of course, is in precipitation. Um, we've only had uh, 11 inches of rain since uh, April 1st. And normally to produce a 200 bushel corn crop, it takes about 20 to 24 inches, depending upon the temperature, to uh, produce you know, a 200 bushel corn crop. And um, you can see we're, um, we're very, very dry. Um, we're uh, probably one of the most dry uh, times was 2021, uh, this, this green line here. So uh, we're, we're a little better than some of the dry years we've had, but of course it has been uh, very dry um, uh, in, at Arlington, which is in the Southern half of the state. For the Northern half of the state, I use Marshfield as, as a reference. And again, for GDU accumulation is pretty much normal. And also for precipitation, it's uh, pretty much normal. And um, so um, I think the northern half of the state isn't quite as bad currently in terms of precip as, as the southern half. Of course, right now we're in the most critical time for um, the corn crop. We're right in this silking stage. I usually consider silking um, in corn occurring between July 15th and August 5th. And that usually covers most of the planting dates and most of the relative maturities in various areas for the state. And this is the most critical time uh, during, um, uh, during, during the year, during the life cycle of corn. And what I'm seeing around, especially in these droughted areas, is a real delay in tasseling. The crop has really been slow to tassel. Usually we'll see tassels around the Arlington area as early as July 10th. And we've seen some fields like that, but there's a lot of fields still that haven't even tasseled yet. And I, and I think this may be due to a, just a development issue that's going on within the corn plant. Whenever stress occurs, normally, again, the tasseling time is July, 5th, or July 15th to August 5th. Normally, uh, when there is stress, tassels and pollen drop occurs earlier than normal while silks are delayed in their development uh, later and later uh, in, in, during the pollination period. Um, what we're seeing and what we sometimes see is, um, uh, you know, this del overall delay going on, but within our plots, we're seeing 115 day hybrids silking the same as 92 day hybrids silking. Very odd in terms of, uh, in terms of their development. And, and again, this is kind of, uh, when, whenever stress occurs, normal development kind of goes out the window. If silks occur before the tassels uh, start to form and, and drop pollen, that's okay. Uh, silks will just continue to grow. They can grow you know, one, two, one to two feet outside of, the, outside of the year, and they'll continue to grow until pollen drops on them and, and are fertilized. But what you're having occurring is the nick um, is just not lining up the way it really, the way it really should. So that's kind of what's going on right now. Of course, silking is, is the main growth and development stage we're in right now, and that'll be going on till about August 5th. One of the things about corn is that these yield components of corn are determined at very different times during the season. Uh, the years per area is really determined at planting and emergence. After that, we typically only get one year per plant. And so that yield component is determined very early in the life cycle of corn. Where we're at right now is the number of kernels that will form on, on, the, on the ear. The number of rows is formed around the V6 to V10 stage of development. But the kernels per row, in other words, the actual pollination of those ovules is determined right now. And the other thing that's being determined right now 
is the eventual kernel weight because the only thing that happens um, after that ovule gets pollinated is cell division. There's no real accumulation of, uh, of photosynthate going into that kernel and all that's going on is cell division and that's what we call the lag phase of kernel development. It's usually it's an S-shaped curve and that, that initial part of the S there is this lag phase where kernel where kernels are just going through cell, cell division. After about seven to 10 days, cell division stops and we can, and then those kernels begin to fill usually in a linear manner. So there's kind of two yield components being determined right at this time here. The number of kernels that are being pollinated or that the ovules being pollinated and the potential size of those kernels through the amount of cell division that occurs in that ovule. So again, there's a lot of stress going on. That's why we consider uh, pollination such an important time uh, in the life cycle of corn. Uh, the other thing that's going on, of course, right now is that this is a huge water demand part of the, of the growing season. Uh, usually corn is, is using about one and a half to two inches of, of uh, precip or of water per week. And you can see at the at the silking and early uh, vegetative, early kernel development stage, you know, we're well over one and a half inches of rain per week. Usually we figure about a quarter to a third of an inch of rain uh, of moisture is being used per day, but a lot of that is dependent upon the temperature. And, um, and again, the warmer the temperature, the more water use that's going to occur. The other thing that's happening right now is that pollen typically isn't very viable above 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course this week we're having a lot of 90 degree days out there. And so, but pollen is produced every morning, every day, and it'll continue to uh, drop as those, as those silks emerge. Um, again, one of the things that happens with corn, the corn life cycle is that normal pollen shed usually occurs over about a 90, nine day period or so. Silks will emerge a day or two after pollen drop begins. And this overlap is what we call the, uh, the, the NIC, okay, or the antithesis to silk interval is what it's called. When there's stress, what typically will happen is that, is that the tassel starts dropping pollen earlier. Both pollen shed and silk emergence are shortened. Okay, so it's only a six day period for, for, uh, for pollen shed. Whereas for silk emergence, it's also, it's only about a five day period, but look at the overlap here. The overlap is only about three to four days rather than eight to nine days under, under normal conditions. And this is oftentimes the problem that we can have in that uh, this nick or this overlap doesn't occur, um, occur adequately to get good pollination across both the butt and tip ear part of the ear as well as that, that middle portion. Okay, but regardless of what goes on, really how we manage the corn really depends upon after this stage and the success of corn pollination after this time. So really no decision should be made until really that, probably that second or third week in August until we know for sure what exactly happened with pollination. And you can tell what happens by a couple of ways. One, you can do what's called a shake test where you can carefully unwrap the ear, sh you know, shake it off and any, shake the, shake the silks off and any silks that fall off, that means that ovule or these little bumps on the ear were fertilized because those silks will fall off within about a 24 hour period. Another option is to wait about 10 days. And again, this is why we wait until that, that uh, kind of that second week in August typically is that you'll start to see these blisters or these, these ovules here develop into blisters, okay? And that is, uh, again, indication that uh, anthesis or silking has occurred and, and uh, you can basically count up the number of kernels that are developing. That doesn't mean all those kernels are gonna develop because you can still have abortion that can go on if, the, if this stress or this drought continues. But you can get a sense of what's going on in terms of your management by the success of that pollination. If it's poor, then you basically harvest any time. If it's fair, then you can leave it for silage harvest. Those kernels will continue to grow 
and you'll continue to get some starch accumulation on that ear. It won't be a pretty ear, but there will be some starch that will be accumulating within those kernels, and that'll help with the overall quality of that silage. Um, if it's good pollination, then normal management, and you can cut it for silage or, or grain, harvest it for grain or whatever, whatever you're going to do. So those are a, a few of the things that um, to, to consider. One of the things that I, I continue to um, watch really closely is what's happening with the cover crop fields. Um, in many fields, especially those that were that were that were killed late, it's just a it's just a debacle out there in terms of the amount of stress that's going on with those crops. So any pictures that you see, one of the key questions that you've got to ask is, was there a cover crop planted and when was it killed? Again, for a lot of what we're seeing in, in our plots right now, where we didn't have cover crops oftentimes, that crop looks good at this point. It's nice and green, it's tall. It's, it's maybe not as tall as normal, but it's actually doing pretty well. Uh, but the crop is still hanging in there a little bit. And if we get any rain, we can maybe still recover uh, a little bit. Again, 2021 was one of the driest we've had on record. And that, that was nearly a record year in terms of grain yield at the end because we were able to get some pretty good and significant moisture out there. So again, I think it's a little early to tell. Um, we still need to get through this pollination period. And then a lot of our decisions are gonna come in that second and third week in, of August to, uh, to uh, look at uh, just how we're gonna manage the corn crop. Uh, a few things, um, you wanna subscribe to our uh, emails. Of course, you can go to our website and subscribe. And then uh, a couple of other things that, uh, where you can follow us as well. So with that, I'll stop basic and turn it back over to you, Natasha. And um, again, anything, any questions I might, you might have, I'll try to watch the chat or else uh, hang around for other questions later if there's time. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lauer. Um, are there any questions for Joe at this time? All right, seeing none, we will move forward. But as he said, he'll stick around. We have several specialists that are sitting um, on the chat as well today. So if you have if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we and we will try to get you the best answer we can. So with that, um, our next speaker is going to be Sean Conley, who is our state uh, soybean and small grain specialist. And he will let us know what's going on in that world. So take it away, Sean. All right, uh, thank you, Natasha. Um, what I think I'll do is kind of have this more as a, a, a chat in that um, I don't have any prepared slides, but I kind of want to walk everyone through what we've been seeing and what's going on out there in the landscape. So I think I'll start with winter wheat as that's starting to come off. Um, the winter wheat crop, for the most part, has been a, an excellent crop. I don't know where NASA is getting their numbers from, but I, almost all of my locations average over 100 bushels per acre really high test weight, really low incidence of, um, you know, fusarium head blight or scab out there. So in general, the, the wheat crop is re looking really good. And I, I think that's something we see every year whenever we have a dry spring, and, or i.e. a drought during the growing season, you usually have a, generally have a very good winter wheat crop. So that's kind of where we're sitting with the winter wheat crop. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about really quickly is oats. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I think the because we did were a little bit delayed and when oats got planted, I think we're gonna have a challenge with our oat crop out there. So again, just be aware that I think we're gonna have low test weight, low yields. Uh, I know there's a lot of weeds coming through, so we're probably gonna have some issues with straw. So just be thinking about that as you start thinking about the oat harvest and, and what's gonna be going on out there. I think there's, again, gonna be some challenges in terms of test weight low, yields low, and that's, that's the bell here at Madison. So we still have a, an old school. Um, belt to switch classes. So anyway, now we'll kind of get into the soybean crop. So soybean, unlike or similar to that in corn, I would say, you know, we, the early season stress doesn't have a lot to do with uh, impacting our soybean crop. Right now, we're anywhere in that R3 to R4 growth stage um, across the landscape. So there are some questions about foliar fungicides, you know, going out there for white mold. I do know some of those are going out, even in some of these droughty areas where their white mold can be an issue. 
Uh, one of the things I do want to remind the growers and those on participating is that I know there's a lot of app applications of different products to alleviate the drought stress. And I don't think mo most of them really don't have any scientific basis that I actually will, will do anything. Uh, one that is you know, out there promoted some is for, you know, applying a foliar fungicide for white, um, excuse me, for plant health. And I think there's been enough research done out there that we're, there's really no scientific evidence that um, applying a foliar fungicide in soybean or plant health is gonna make a huge difference in a drought year. Obviously, if you don't get any rain, there's really not going to be any, child, any biomass produced. So just something to think about out there in terms of trying to make these ap applications and trying to rescue a crop. Um, I know Marta Coleman is on, and she'll probably talk about forages in general. But in terms of soybean, in terms of using that as a rescue forage, if, if, if farmers are thinking about it, uh, there are two different really time frames to harvest uh, soybean as a as a forage, R3, R4, kind of where we're sitting at right now is one optimal time. Second time is R7. Uh, the challenge with R7, you have to be very careful with the mowing and conditioning operation because you'll lose a lot of that seed out there in these windrows. And also at that point, you tend to have really low moisture. Um, if you're cutting around this R3, R4 time, you usually have about 80% moisture out there. So you do need to let it dry down a little bit to get to that 65% in order to either in silent or to put it into a bunker. So a couple of quick things on that side. Um, another couple of things that are really popping up right now is anytime you get a dry year, we have questions with spider mites. Uh, again, just uh, there are some always these um, references that, oh, if it, we get a big rainfall, that is going to alleviate our spider mite problem. Well, we tried that, personally tried that myself in 2012, and that really didn't fix the problem. So yes, a, a, a rainfall event will kind of slow them down for a few days, but again, continue to scout and monitor because if you just have one rainfall event and it remains to be dry out there, you'll still have spider mites moving in from edge of the field. If you catch it early enough, you can usually just spray the outside round or two. And that'll be a, you know, take care of the problem. Another thing that's really popping up this year that's kind of new and I haven't seen or heard as much of this in the last 10 years is soybean aphids. Uh, we're getting some reports specifically in the northern part of the state and you know by north I mean north of Hancock. So the, I would say the upper two thirds of the state where we're gonna be seeing a lot of the reports for uh, soybean aphids. Remember, regardless of price, regardless of droughts, the threshold is still 250 aphids per plant when 80% of the plants are infested and that population is building. And uh, I did have a couple of questions about how do we go through and assess any of the beneficial insects that are out there. And that's the, how you assess the beneficial impact is whether or not that soybean aphid population is, is increasing. If you're right at 200 and there's a lot of beneficials out there and you come back a couple of days, you're still at 200. That just tells you the beneficials are doing their job and not to make an application because most of the products out there will basically knock down the aphids and the beneficials as well. Another thing that's really popped up uh, over the last week is if, um, is that um, we had really dry conditions. Um, so our, we basically had one tap root for that soybean plant. And then we had uh, obviously the seed treatment, if you did use a seed, seed treatment is gone at this point. And then we had a significant rainfall events probably about 10 days ago across many parts of the state that we had water sitting in fields for an extended period of time. Now we're seeing these pockets of dying plants all across the states. Um, a lot of that is coming back as Phytophthora. Um, a couple of things to mention in that is that if we just looked at my variety trial from last year, and there's probably about a quarter of the varieties that were in my variety trial last year did not even have a Phytophthora resistance gene in it. And most of the other ones only had single sources of resistance. So I think uh, one of the things that Damon and uh, I are looking at is are we seeing a shift in these in the resistance and is the one case starting to fail? So if you have any questions about that, feel free to pull some samples and send them in here to the lab to, to uh, confirm whether or not we have Phytophthora. But I think that's a growing, a growing cha um, challenge across across not just Wisconsin but across the Upper Midwest. So I think with that, um, uh, the last point I want to make is very similar to what uh, Joe had shown about the, the need for 
moisture. One of the advantages of soybean is that it has phenotypic plasticity. Um, I mean, basically its ability to respond to the environment is in you know, simple layman's terms. And one of the things that unlike corn, we have a, a shorter window for pollination to occur on soybeans. You can have flowering and pollination occur from four to six weeks, just depending on where you are, not just in, mid, in Wisconsin, but in the Midwest. So we have a lot, lot, lot longer time frame for that pollination to occur. So we can sneak in and still get some decent yields uh, where we have some of these events where we might have a, like a week of um, soybeans that um, don't really get um, a rainfall or tot during a week. And after that, it cools off, we get some rainfall events then we'll see a flush of flowers and then we can have pollination and, at that point. So with that, I'm gonna pause. I see there's been some questions popping up. Joe has been answering, are there any specific questions uh, for, for me either in the chat or people can raise their hands. I yeah, do a couple of things, you know, there's been some weird things popping up on, you know, I follow Twitter and I, if anyone wants to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Badgerbean. But a lot of these challenges with, with um, Soybean people are saying, well, it's the Canadian wildfires or it's UFOs or some weird stuff out there. So at this point, no, it's just nature and the environment. I don't, there hasn't been any significant response to the soybean crop in terms of what the wildfires have done or, I mean, or UFOs, but I haven't seen any UFOs. So anyway. All right. Uh, thank questions. you, Sean. Yeah. yeah. What disease issues come up when hail injures but doesn't completely destroy a crop such as soybeans? Yeah, I think a lot of those are bacterial diseases. Uh, they'll come in and, and move into those wounds. And just remember the most, well, not most, the foliar fungicides, you know, protect against fun, fungi and not bacterial. So, you know, even if you do have a significant hail event, We've done the research about not just in Wisconsin, but in Iowa as well. Applying a foliar fungicide after a, a, a hail event really didn't see any significant yield increases. And again, you're not protecting against the, the pathogens out there that would are most likely to infect that soybean or for that matter, probably corn crop as well, which would be bacterial and not fungal. Good question though, thank you. Um, are there any things that are protective after after a hail event against a bacterial? Um, well, there are some like, like a copper um, product would be something that you, you may want to consider. There are a few fungicides out there that uh, um, you can put out there and the copper products are relatively inexpensive compared to some of the other ones. They're older chemistries. Then you also have to understand, make sure you follow the label because if you are in more of a forage system or a dairy system where you still might take that as a forage, if it gets really bad, I, I, I don't know about the label in terms of these copper materials for feeding. So just make sure you follow the label, but that'd be the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. About how much um, moisture does it take for, I don't know, for for from flour to grain fill on, uh, on soybeans? Yeah, it's similar to what Joe had put up there about an inch to an inch and a half a week um, in terms of the rainfall event. So it'd be right around that 18, well, 18 to 24 inches is the season long duration. So probably that 12 to 15, just, well, if we know it's what week is it right now, it's July. So we need an inch and a half for the next six weeks. So there we go, about nine inches, nine, 10 inches to, to finish that soybean crop off. We can help. All right. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, we'll see if any more questions come in for you. We may uh, circle back. If there's a lot of questions about one topic, we can circle back to them and, and, and open up the discussion again uh, if our specialists are sticking around. So with that, I think we're gonna move over to Marta. Um, so Marta is our um, state forage uh, ecology specialist in, um, there it is, Forage Systems Agroecology uh, with uh, UW Extension, <laughs> UW Madison. So I will turn it over to you, Marta. Thank you, Natasha, for the introduction. Can you see my slides? Yes, we're great, thank you. Okay, yes, it is a very, very long title. Um, I wanted to talk today a little bit about managing drought stress in forage systems. Um, I wanted to start 
and I don't need to spend too much time on this because Joe already um, whoops, talked about it. Um, but this is the current state of uh, the drought monitor in the state of Wisconsin. I just wanted to go very quickly over the legend on uh, the bottom left. So anything that is in yellow in the state is not considered under drought yet, but is under some level of dry conditions. Uh, so abnormally dry on the right hand side, you can see a little bit of a longer description of what that means. Um, so when we look at this map, we can see that the whole of the state is in some level of drought or dry weather. Um, around a third of the state is under severe drought. Um, a third of the state is under moderate dry, which is uh, drought, which is this like light uh, peach color. And then around 13% is under extreme drought, which is major um, crop losses. So um, when we look at this, and again, I don't need to extend too much on the subject because uh, Dr. Lara already uh, discussed this a little bit. We're looking at the map now of inches of precipitation in the last seven days. So this map is showing uh, how much precipitation we had. It, so it varied very little to below 0.5 to around one, one and a half inches. Um, and on the right hand map, you can see what is the forecast of precipitation for the next seven days. So anywhere between less than a half an inch to around one inch to a little bit greater precipitation uh, on the purple color is around one inch for the next week. Another aspect of how we get to a dry or a drought condition uh, is temperature. So uh, I wanted to just stay a second here on this map. Again, this is showing uh, on the left is the seven day average maximum temperature in Fahrenheit. So we can see that the central south is between 80 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit and the northeast is between 70 and 80 degrees. And when we look at the, the map on the right hand side, that is showing the seven day departure from normal. So basically what that map is showing is how much different from normal conditions um, is the temperature for a week. So uh, we have been experiencing temperatures that are a little bit greater, but as Dr. Laura already indicated, most of the drought is lower precipitation. So there is a little bit of a temperature factor as well, um, but most of it is, is, is precipitation. So one of the things that I wanted to very quickly mention as we are looking at drought management is why are some forages uh, more uh, tolerant, more resistant to drought conditions than others? And I want to talk first about alfalfa, which is relatively drought tolerant. Some of that is associated with the origin of the species, which is at modern uh, present day northern part of uh, Iraq and Iran. Uh, most of us are already quite familiar with this crop, but it develops a very long uh, tap root, very deep root system. Um, what that allows this plant to do is to access water at lower uh, depths inside the, uh, in the soil. So that's one of the characteristics of this crop that allows it to be a little bit more drought tolerant. Uh, so as dry conditions continue, typically what happens is growth really slows down. So it, this plant basically parks the growth and uh, there is a reduction in nutritive value as well. So the plants mature faster. What that means is that whatever it is that you're using this forage for hay or silage or haylage uh, or grazing, the nutritive value for the, this crop is going to reduce. So as we move forward, we need to choose. Um, we have to weigh in the cost of harvest in terms of human labor versus the estimated biomass. So it might be that the most economically feasible choice that you have is to not harvest the alfalfa because it's just not gonna be worth it in terms of production. Um, one of the things that I indicated before is that as um, dry conditions increase and this plant becomes more mature, the nutritive value is going to be reduced. So if you are in doubt, 
you can test that forage to see what is the nutritive value that it has. What that's going to help you is decide whether or not um, you should direct the hay silage or haylage that you're producing for this drought from this drought stress alfalfa towards um, your lactating animals that have a very high nutritive requirement. Or if the quality is lower, you can direct that to your heifers or your dry cows. And I found an interesting uh, resource from University of Nebraska. I will share this link later and all the other links that I'm going to be sharing today. Some of the other forages that I wanted to mention that are also very drought tolerant are the warm season annuals. So uh, sorghum, sudan grass, sorghum, sudan hybrids. One of the reasons why these plants are more drought tolerant is that they have both morphological and physiological mechanisms to kind of um, manage the, the drought. So basically what happens is that these warm season grasses, they can continue to, to do photosynthesis even when the temperature is higher. Um, typically they do have a little bit nutritive, a little bit lower nutritive value than other cool season plants, but it can still uh, reach good animal uh, requirement levels. So one of the things that we can think about moving forward, and I presented this perhaps a month ago when we were talking about uh, monitoring drought. So the left hand side map is showing the drought monitor. So it's the same scale that I showed in the first slide that I had. Um, this is for the whole of the United States. And on the right hand side, you can see the alfalfa hay area in drought. So the map on the right hand side has two shades of green, a very light green and a darker green. The light green is minor hay area for alfalfa and the darker green is major hay areas for alfalfa. And you can see that there's a kind of like a shaded red that kind of matches whatever regions are in drought on the left-hand map. So basically what I'm trying to um, communicate here is that you can see there that around one third of alfalfa hay acreage is within areas that are experiencing some level of drought. So we know that that can affect availability of resources. So if you are looking into buying hay, um, it might be a good idea to start thinking about uh, how you're going to proceed because as time goes by, if the drought doesn't alleviate, we might have a reduction in availability and increase in, in price. Um, and also the best hay is gonna be sold first and the lower quality hay is gonna stay behind. So again, one of the things to do is to test that hay and direct that to the animal categories that, um, you think are gonna be more adequate for that level of, of forage. Um, Dr. Conley already mentioned this a little bit that you can use soybeans uh, as a forage. So this table on the right um, is showing different forages than our typical alfalfa, for example, that we can plant. Um, so two options that I wanted to mention are fall oats and forage rye. Uh, fall oats, there are options for planting both early and later. They can provide four to 6,000 uh, pounds dry matter per acre. Um, there is a link there that is about the management and what to expect in terms of nutritive value. I'm gonna make that available uh, after this presentation. Forage rye as well. There are some options for planting later um, in, the, in the season. Uh, so they can be good alternatives for if you're looking for increasing the amount of hay hay that you have stored. It's getting a little bit late for warm season annuals. So I wanted to make sure that I mentioned these two other options. Um, finally, I wanted to very quickly touch on a couple of aspects associated with animal management during drought and heat. One of them is if you have warm season annuals like sorghum, sudan grass and their hybrids is the presence or possibility of having prussic acid uh, poisoning. Some of the symptoms of, of that are animals start first breeding quite quickly, and then they start breeding with a lot of labor. They have muscle spasms and dilated pupils in their eyes. Um, this is more common in younger plants and also when you have nitrogen fertilizer applications. So one of the options is to split that nitrogen fertilizer application 
and also greater risk uh, after frost. I know that we're not there yet, but I just want uh, us to keep that in mind. The other one is nitrate toxicity, which can occur in forages with high nitrate concentration. The same symptoms are kind of similar to prussic acid poisoning. So habit breathing, uh, muscle tremors and coordination. Um, it's common in drought conditions that and after frost because of the drought condition issues, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned it. Um, so I also found some good resources to kind of identify that uh, if you are suspicious that your animals might be um, suffering from either one of those, I would recommend talking to a veterinary, making sure that you can act quickly to reverse the condition. Um, and finally, going back to this map that is showing temperatures have been uh, somewhat high, I also wanted to mention that we need to keep an eye out on heat stress. Um, symptoms, again, uh, typically animals start breeding very fast, they start panting, they can start drooling, um, breeding with their mouth, mouth open. One of the consequences of heat stress is uh, declining productivity, not only milk, but animals will uh, eat less, so less milk production, less weight gain. Uh, so we need to make sure that the animals have access to shade and also to clean water. Um, avoid animals, uh, management animals, moving animals, vaccinating during the warmer days and warmer times of the day. Uh, avoid hauling animals as well at warmer times of the day. And there are two very good resources from UW here that show uh, ways to manage heat stress in both dairy and beef. I'm gonna share both of these links at the end of the presentation just for us to keep in mind. That's it. Uh, I'm going to stick around. If you have any questions now, I'll be happy to answer, uh, but I'm going to stick around for the rest of the program, so I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that they, as they come in. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. Um, do we have any questions for Marta at the moment? Um, See, there is one comment here about emergency crops and yeah, um, planting I, corn late in the season. Yes, yeah, so uh, I think those links that I listed on my presentation have a lot of detailed information, but yes, there are uh, options for forages for this time of the season. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, uh, fall oats and rye are options. Uh, soybean is actually an option as well. Uh, I'll be happy to share more detailed information about that. Yeah, and we are going to compile all of the uh, links and, and resources provided by our speakers today into a, a resource document that will be um, that will be put on, on our website as well. Um, so don't worry, you will be able to find all of this easily. So again, thank you so much for all those resources. Do we have yeah. any other questions at the moment about forage? All right. Um, so I guess I have one um, of, you know, is there what 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 does it take to uh, kick alfalfa into the uh, growth stage again? You know, if if it's gone dormant, you know, so say you took second crop because it went it went to bloom really early, and now it's just sitting there not doing anything, and um, you know. You know, but worrying about, you know, it's it's going to be August and are we going to get a third crop and a fourth, a good, could dream about a fourth crop, you know, so what are we, uh, what are we thinking in terms of, because we don't want to cut too late for alfalfa for, you know, longevity. So what are we thinking in terms of how much rain do we need to, to get uh, alfalfa going again? Yeah, so if the rain normalizes, uh, the, the alfalfa will react to it and will start growing again. Uh, in terms of exactly how many inches, I'll be honest, I don't know. I don't know if anyone in the call might have that information. If not, I will look it up and, and get back to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, uh, Marta. Um, so with that, we are going to transfer over to uh, Dr. John Jones, who is a soil researcher. Uh, with UW, and he is going to be talking to us about fertility management 
under dry conditions, which I know is something a lot of us have been thinking about, uh, especially with our, if we're gonna be doing some late planted crops. So with that, I will hand it over to John. All right, Natasha, can you see my screen all right? Yes, you're good. Great, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, it's been a, a fun year as a soil fertility person to, uh, to look at nutrient deficiencies and drought conditions, but certainly not fun uh, from the farming aspect. So what I'll talk about today are just some, some brief concepts of, of why certain nutrient deficiencies are popping up um, and why maybe the best um, course of action is to not look at the field for a while um, and, uh, and soil test uh, after we have a, a drought condition. Um, just a reminder, this is a, um, from some work I did previously looking at nutrient and nitrogen balances across different states, but this is a, essentially a simple diagram that shows nutrient and in, nitrogen inputs um, subtracted, or excuse me, and then you subtract the nitrogen outputs as harvest removal for Wisconsin for about a 30-year period. Um, and as you can see in general, there's a positive balance, and we would expect that in a state with as much livestock um, activity as we have. But... Um, the, when you look at the, the high peaks in this, this figure here in these lines, um, certainly there are years where we know that there has either been some type of either environmental or in, the, in terms of 2008, um, actually a kind of global economic issue that's affected some of these nitrogen balances across the state. So 1988, 2012, certainly years where we, where we um, consider drought as a limiting factor for um, for plant production, and we had essentially lower uh, lower harvested removal during those years. 2008 was uh, more effective kind of global economics and fertilizer prices. But what I think is more important uh, than kind of harping on what happened in those, those drought years is what are you gonna do the next year after that? Um, how are you gonna account for that accumulation of nutrients where as long as you don't have maybe say a spring flush in the spring of 2024, if we do continue on with droughty conditions, how do, we, how do we account for those, those nutrients that would be available and we wouldn't have to spend um, money on to fertilize for? Quick, uh, a, a quick refresher. Um, this is a complicated diagram with a lot of uh, nutrient forms and why, how they reach plant roots and how they're taken up and move. The most important thing about this whole diagram is this blue line here that goes around everything, meaning that we need soil water to move nutrients. And so uh, it seems like everyone has been, uh, had, had fun uh, finding potassium deficiencies in certain crops this year because potassium is very affected by soil water and pore water and how that diffuses from, um, from soil particles to plant roots. And so this really isn't, isn't surprising that what we're seeing, you may see it worse on uh, eroded hill, hill slopes or hill tops where you simply have less soil moisture. So. The take home message here is we need soil water to move nutrients, whether it's mass flow of nutrients like nitrogen or diffusion of, of nutrients like phosphorus and potassium. In fact, in sandy soils, potassium actually acts a little bit more like nitrogen and moves more with uh, mass flow than with more loamy or clay soils. So we can see the importance of, of soil moisture here. But what does that mean for crops in the field? Uh, so this is at one of uh, my Arlington sites looking at different soil um, test potassium levels and how that relates to crop yield and productivity, sustainability. Um, and again, this is just at, at the Arlington site. We've got sites across the state. And essentially, when you're looking at the deficiency symptoms that I, I'm sure many of us have seen, you see that outer leaf margin chlorosis. That's that's pretty um, stereotypical for um, for potassium. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is later. Um, and, and these deficiency symptoms you can see when we move from what we would consider a low testing soil to kind of a um, bottom of the optimum range uh, uh, or lower end of the optimum range of soil, um, of testing soil to what we consider kind of optimum bordering on the high range on the right in 100, moving from 76 to 103 to 127. And you can see that if, if soils were at least optimum or higher, I would say, really those deficiency symptoms aren't showing up. Um, and so I think that begs the question of these kind of drought induced potassium deficiencies. Certainly we see a reduction in movement of potassium in soils and around roots. However, if we are just kind of making sure that we have those boxes checked for base kind of base fertility management, you're probably all right in terms of potassium availability. And I'll talk about potassium quite a bit because that's kind of the one that we're seeing as affected by, by soil moisture. So this is, this is a good reminder of 
um, getting your soil tests right can buffer against this. This isn't saying get high soil test potassium levels because that's not really needed. Optimum levels should, should be able to buffer against um, uh, dry conditions. If other, um, if other things are restricting growth, actual water stress, not just, not just um, nutrient derived water stress, then that's something else that, that we can't really manage to the same degree. So why do we see uh, leaf uh, chlorochloosis on the leaf margins in general? That's a, um, and it, it, it depends on kind of the cultivar and the plants and things like that. But in, in general, it's an accumulation of organic acids that start to, um, uh, sugars can accumulate there too, but in general, potassium can help uh, balance charges in plants and it balances organic acids. They'll start to accumulate on the lower leaf or the outer leaf margins. We also get some reduction in, in nitrogen movement and, and reduction in plants. But in general, you're seeing things accumulate where you don't want them because we don't have potassium to, to help metabolize those. So look at a few, few slides of data really quick here. Um, this is yield response to potassium fertilization. And what I did in these few slides, and this is a longer term study, um, but it includes uh, 2000, 2012 and at least one more, what we consider dry year up until um, this year, the study is still going on. And so what I did was I just broke the data out into years where we had, um, years where we had lower, um, lower precipitation, essentially five inches of uh, reduced precipitation in the growing season um, compared to years where we would consider that kind of fit in that 30 year average trend. And I don't know why the, the, the um, legend's not popping up on here, but, but the, the open or white circles are always the dry years and the, the black circles are always the, what we consider normal or wet years, whatever a normal year may be. And so when you look at corn yield response on the left, soybean yield response on the right to potassium fertilization, you see that, and this is in a, a soil where we, we consider low, not very low, but low testing soil. You can see in the parentheses, 65 to 85 parts per million. It ranged over, over 10 to 12 years. And in general, we had about 100, um, we had about a 100 uh, pound of K2O per acre optimum rate for years where we had sufficient rainfall. That was a little bit higher for dry years, but if you think about the reduction in yield potential or um, kind of partial profit with corn corn yield here, it really it wouldn't have been worth applying that extra 21 pounds. So really that that optimum rate still still stands for this kind of low testing soil. On on soybeans, we we see a, a little bit different story where where in that those dry years there was a, a lower agronomic optimum K rate. But in general, again, you're you're not necessarily wanting to change management ahead of that year and trying to to predict weather unless you're able to do so. So that kind of 108 pounds of K2O was, was optimum here. Again, about 73 bushels per acre. Corn and soybean rotation, you're, you're really kind of hitting that same number. So this is good to see that, again, um, we would expect this kind of out of whack um, nutritional demand in dry years. But in general, if you want to maintain, let's say, higher soil K insurance for dry years, that really wouldn't pay off. When we look at nutrient uptake, and, and so I'm, I'm just going to show corn in the next two slides here, um, but really what this is showing is phos total phosphorus uptake and total potassium uptake over the growing season. And, uh, and essentially um, what you're looking at on the x-axis is different rates of potassium, and then again I segmented it into dry or what we consider average, average years with that, at least sufficient rainfall. And so when we look at total phosphorus and total potassium on the right, um, uptake, we can see that certainly there's a big difference, right? And that's so that really shouldn't be a big surprise. We have limited nutrient availability, probably just more limited root growth. And so that's that's leading to a reduction in total uptake. Um, it's always interesting to see uh, potassium uptake in, in biomass trends, whether that's a luxury accumulation or not. You see that can that continuing up to higher rates of potassium fertilization where in these other instances for phosphorus and then in dry years for potassium, you kind of see a plateau. And again, there's a, there's a big difference in the, the amount of data that's represented in these two points, 16 site years versus four, but those are the years where, where there was a reduction in precipitation. So this is important to remember. And really where that feeds into then is crop removal. And that's something we're, we're certainly con concerned about when thinking about fertilization for the next year, if you're trying to maintain an optimum soil test or soil testing uh, level. And so this is grain pea removal for corn on the left. Um, 
uh, grain K removal for corn on the right. Again, those kind of same, same data set broken out into potassium rate on the bottom and then dry and, and average years. And in general, we see um, pretty, pretty similar when we're not applying any potassium to a low, low testing soil, that wouldn't really be surprising. Once we start to apply some K though, in general, the difference between those white circles and black circles is actually pretty consistent. And so it's about a 30 pound of P205 um, per acre difference in grain removal um, for, um, for these higher K, um, higher K rates, uh, it, whether comparing the average year where sufficient rainfall with dry years. So that's something to think about and, and keep in your back pocket. For potassium, it was a little bit less. Um, again, this is probably this is probably reduced because of just the um, reduction in uh, in biomass accumulation and and or excuse me, the the continuation of biomass accumulation of K, but the plateau of grain accumulation of K. K can accumulate pretty effectively in biomass as we keep applying more, but in grain, there's a certain percentage that's going to start to plateau. And so this is something to, to think about as well. And, and really where that feeds into is that if this is going to occur this year, if, if, if precipitation patterns continue what they've been so far, these numbers might be something that you'd want to consider um, when eventually calculating your removal, which you might use for fertilization next year. I do want to quick hit on, on nitrogen use efficiency, um, because in general, and for a lot of different reasons, whether they're physiological or within the soil, um, we do see uh, reduced NUE when we have drier conditions. And so that shouldn't be a big surprise. Um, and so again, this is the figure I showed before on the left where we're looking at that corn yield and in, in uh, sufficient rainfall and dry conditions. This is the same data that you're seeing on the left and the right. And again, the, and this is in the corn nitrogen use efficiency is expressed here in pounds of N needed to, um, to grow a bushel of corn. So a higher value is worse, essentially. And as you can see, those, those open circles when we have dry years are always higher than the black circles when we have wet years. Not really a, a huge surprise. And then in this case, as we added K, we did reduce the nitrogen use efficiency, though when you get to this kind of 80 pound of K2O per acre, there's not really a statistical change here. These are, are just standard errors. So it's um, just kind of ranges to, to consider. But we are always higher um, when there's dry years, which means that that plant uses N more efficiently in, um, in the wet years, or more probably more accurately, the soil is available to supply N better in the wet years. So kind of going through some data slides and, and kind of some background fundamental information about soil water and why, why we care about it. Um, these are some considerations I would think about when, when talking to farmers and agronomists um, this year and, and some things that really will be determined in the next you know, uh, four, four weeks or so, especially related to soil nutrient availability. So optimum soil test levels of P and K, they should supply sufficient nutrients. Whether, whether you're seeing a, a water stress or not, um, those nutrients are, are in a certain, we, we consider optimum concentration for a reason. Um, I do have a side dress potassium project that's pretty pretty large going on this year for the first year. Um, I have not seen any differences in 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 um, deficiency symptoms. I'll take soil tests at the end of the year and we'll kind of look at what those and obviously the combine will speak for itself when we talk talk about where side dressing K may have been valuable. There's some data out of Iowa State that shows in low soil test condition side dressing potassium. Maybe um, I'll have data comparing pre-plant and side dress too. So we'll kind of answer that, that question if that would be a viable way to provide enough K in season or if there, I, I don't really believe in these um, rescue treatments of, of potassium when you see deficiencies because the way plants use potassium, it's never going to go back to that, that leaf where it's already deficient. You're not going to correct that, that visual symptom. Um, and again, in, in a given field, especially when we see different differences and maybe potassium deficiencies, that's probably an indi indication of soil supply that may be happening. That may be a good indication of, of where you might want to build some zones to soil sample and if potash is needed or if it's not, that might be something to consider. Um, crop removal values can change with drought, certainly with, with crop growth and reduced grain yield. Please consider that for either fertilizing this fall or next spring. And one really important bullet that I didn't put any data or, or pictures of anything is soil conditions when you're soil sampling can really affect some values when analyzing them in the lab. Um, pH is certainly one. If you're making a lime recommendation off of 
a soil sample taken this fall if dry conditions continue, um, that needs to be taken into context. Um, even though, even if you've sampled in the fall every year for the past 20 years, and this year is very different in terms of soil moisture, that's going to affect your, your pH value. Um, and then potassium, especially in soils with higher clay contents. We see, you know, clays are kind of similar to sheets of paper in the soil. When we see dry conditions, we see those edges flay out and some potassium can be released. So you may actually get elevated levels of potassium that aren't really plant available. Um, and in different, so more loamy soils that don't have as high clay value, you can actually get reduced levels um, because you kind of trap some potassium between some clay layers. So take, take the soil, soil sampling and analysis in the context of the soil conditions this year. If it's still really dry, maybe waiting to sample in the spring if you have time for it might be a good option. Um, I know that was a lot of information, but I'd be glad to, uh, to answer any questions if, uh, if any have, have come up. We don't have any questions in the chat at the moment. Are there any questions about uh, fertility management in this dry year? All right, seeing none, um, if we have anything that pops up, I, we will circle back. Um, all right, we are going to switch gears from the cropping side to the, the thing that's brought us all here today, the weather itself. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to Steve Vavris, who is our state climatologist based at UW, and uh, he will talk to us about the drought. All right, thanks, Natasha. So um, I'm gonna be just kind of describing and, and um, quantifying just how extreme our drought has been and how long it's been going and, and with an eye toward the future when it might end. So when I spoke at this last uh, Badger Crop Connect report back seven weeks ago in early June, this is what the drought monitor map looked like. And it was fairly benign. Uh, about 10% 10, 10 of the state had no, not even abnormally dry conditions, uh, about two thirds abnormally dry and a quarter in moderate drought. But if we fast forward to this week, uh, it's a very different picture. Uh, following up in drilling down more on, on what Marta described, uh, this is the, the current state of Wisconsin right now with over a third in moderate drought and in severe drought. And uh, as it has been the case for many weeks, um, no part of the state has completely escaped. Uh, everywhere is at least abnormally dry. Now, one of the ways that we can boil all this down into a statewide average to characterize conditions right now is through this metric called the Drought Severity Coverage Index. And it's kind of a mouthful, but it's not that difficult to, to conceptualize. It's basically a way of combining the severity of the drought and the spatial extent of the drought into a single number. And what this is, is a spatially weighted average across all of Wisconsin of all the drought categories. So you see here the drought categories get a score of zero if you're in the none, uh, a score of one if you're abnormally dry in the northeast, two for moderate drought, three for severe drought, and then four the D3 extreme drought. And if you do that, and this is something that a product that comes out of the drought monitor, uh, we can calculate where we stand historically right now compared to the long-term average since the drought monitor began in 2000. And what it shows in part is just how exceptional this summer has been. It's, it's not just our perception that we're in a bad drought, but if you look at this long 23-year time series, where we stand at the moment is right here, just a shade below where we were a couple weeks ago. And it, only three times, three weeks, has there been a higher index on record. One of them was just a couple weeks ago. The other was the peak in the terrible 2012 drought. And the other was the peak in the 2005 drought. So this, this index is really helpful for giving us a big perspective, uh, at, you know, boiling it down statewide. And you also see this big gap uh, during the 20 teens, which is our wettest decade on record. And we really weren't, for the most part, concerned about drought. The other thing that's nice about this index is that it can also quantify the flashiness of drought. We've talked about, you know, Joe brought up this question about how uh, are we in a flash drought? 
And the way we can use this index is, in this case, to look at, say, the four-week change in this drought severity coverage index, look at how big of a change there was over that four-week period, and then compare with other instances in the historical record. And when I did that, what you see is that uh, here we are in 2023, the, the biggest increase uh, in the four-week change in this drought severity coverage index occurred last month. And this is the second biggest flash drought uh, in terms of intensity that we've seen on record. Only the one in 2003 was bigger, but that did occur later in the season and therefore with different agricultural impacts. So not only in terms of the, the severity of this summer's drought, but also how quickly it came on, how flashy it was, is also among the handful of extreme cases in the record. Now, one of the reasons for and symptoms of the current exceptional drought has been not only the lack of rainfall, but also just how dry in terms of low humidity our air has been. And this graphic shows the average relative humidity anomaly since the beginning of May, roughly the beginning of our drought. And it shows that we're not alone. There's this big bullseye over Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin of the, the driest air masses uh, during this period. And the core region in red is where there's more than 10% lower relative humidity than normal. So most or much of Wisconsin's right in that bullseye. And you see that, you know, concentric circles around it mean that the entire state has been unusually dry in terms of uh, relative humidity throughout the, the late spring and the middle of summer. Now, getting back to rainfall specifically, uh, Wisconsin has just gone through the, dry, the third driest May-June on record. And here's the time series that goes back to 1895, uh, the, the long-term mean and the gray line. And here is, unfortunately, where we are in 2023. So statewide, we averaged only three and a half inches of rainfall totaled in May and June. That's actually smaller than the deficit, 4.2. Uh, so when your total is, is a smaller number than your deficit, you know you're having a really bad year. And the last time we had a May-June this bad, this dry, was the infamous 1988 year. And before that, you have to go back more than a century, back to 1910. So again, underscoring this point that this is, a, this is going in as a, a historic drought in the, um, in the Wisconsin record, the way things are shaping up. And uh, so the May-June rainfall average statewide was just under half of normal. And so far in July, the preliminary numbers show that we're about 70% of normal. So that's an improvement, but still, when you're about 30% below average, you're still not doing great. And of course, we need to do much better than average to catch up to where we need to be. So although we have had some beneficial rains in places lately, uh, we have a long way to go before we're, we're back to where we, we need to be. We're not alone in terms of, as I said, in terms of dry air masses, but we're also not alone in terms of rainfall deficits. So as I said, May, June was the third driest in Wisconsin on record, uh, but the upper Midwest in general was dry. Uh, you see these rankings of how dry, um, the ranking of the, the May, June precipitation over the 129 year period, the brown states are those that were exceptionally dry. But you see here that even amongst the dry, Wisconsin was the driest. So I don't think that's a badge of honor, but it does put things in perspective that not only relative to our own state, we've been remarkably dry, but also in terms of the, the, the nation and other states, we've been the driest or the, you know, more, more dry than other states in May, June. And here's a breakdown of how it's been looking across the state um, from the beginning of May until this week as a rainfall percentage of normal. These are the nine climate divisions in Wisconsin. And one of the things that stands out is that everywhere has been dry. Um, the, the best you can get is about 70% of normal here in the Northeast. The worst is somewhat under half in the Northwest, similar in the Southwest, only a little better in South Central Wisconsin. So this isn't one of those droughts where one part of the state gets hammered and the other areas are doing okay. This has been characterized by almost uniform dryness in, in, in having a rainfall deficit and dry air masses throughout Wisconsin. 
And the other thing to bring up that's associated with the dryness both here and to our north has been the unmistakable smokiness of our air repeatedly since the well June especially and into July here. And that's been caused by a record wildfire season in Canada. The most extreme instance was in late June when we were getting a northeasterly flow bringing wildfire smoke in from Quebec, very unusual. And it produced air quality that was the worst in North America over the Great Lakes. And you see this little splotch near Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin had the worst air quality in, in the, um, the northern hem uh, in North America. And it was also the worst on record in Milwaukee, Madison, Platteville, Green Bay, many of the air quality monitoring stations that EPA has kept track of since 1999. And I've lived in Wisconsin since 1990, and I'm sure we didn't have anything this bad until, um, until this summer. So it has been exceptional. In terms of how it affects crops, my understanding is it's a mixed bag. Uh, smokiness cuts down on the direct solar ratio radiation, which has a negative impact on crops, but it can have a beneficial effect in terms of diffusing more of that solar radiation, which allows more canopy penetration of the sunlight and also takes some of the edge off the surface heating of the leaves and during hot conditions that can be beneficial. So a bit of a mixed bag in terms of how this may affect crop yield. Now, one of the saving graces of the current drought that's made it so that it hasn't been worse for agriculture has been that we haven't been as extreme in terms of heat as we have been in other major droughts like in 2012 or 1988. And we can see this from the average temperature departure from normal since the beginning of May. Areas in gray are within one degree of the long-term normal. And that is true of most of the state. The one exception being far western and northwestern Wisconsin, which has been warmer than, than elsewhere. But this picture of the average daily highs and daily lows over this period doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, as Marta pointed out, we've had some uh, daytime heat, which is typical of dry air masses. They heat up a lot during the day and they cool off efficiently at night. And we're seeing that reflected in the map of average daily maximum temperatures over this period. Uh, plenty of places more than a degree warmer than average. And again, it's the west and northwest that's been affected the most, up to a few degrees above average. But we've benefited a lot from the way the temperatures have cooled at night, thanks to the dry air masses. Uh, much of the state within a degree of the long-term average, and interestingly, plenty of places in green, meaning they've been more than a degree below average. So that's been a, a relief for whether you have livestock, whether you're human or pets, everybody uh, benefits from that uh, replenishment that we can gain at night uh, until this week when the humidity really cranked up. Now, in terms of stream flow, it's really been a mixed bag all summer trying to make sense of the stream flow. So this is the current stream flow uh, color coded by where we are relative to normal. The green is near normal, and you see that most of the state is that way in terms of stream flow with the brighter colors, warmer colors being short flow in terms of stream, um, stream flow rates. And it's been surprising to me that we haven't seen worse conditions throughout Wisconsin this summer. We certainly have in Illinois. Illinois, um, but I know some of these are spring fed and, and there's various local factors that can affect stream flow, but I would say that this does indicate that we're not in severe hydrological drought, at least in Wisconsin, although certainly there are pockets um, where streams have been suffering and you, you see really low um, stream flow and, and some smaller creeks have even dried up. There's been reports up here in the far northwest of that. As an update to the map that we saw earlier, this is the current estimate of rainfall over the next seven days. Uh, depending on where you are, there's some degree of hope, not so much in the north and northwest. It's looking more like the south and southeast will um, experience a um, uh, substantial rainfalls. The light blue colors are um, areas where there could be over an inch and a half or an inch and a quarter and the purple an inch and a half. But of course, summer rainfall tends to be very spotty. So we'll see what actually plays out. 
And then in terms of taking a look a little bit later, the uh, week to two week forecast, um, not a strong signal in terms of temperature. The weather service is saying near normal uh, odds of, of a cooler or warmer than normal. What we really care about is the precipitation, not great news. Um, looking like if anything, we'll see the greater chances of below normal rainfall during the first week of August, but this is not a really strong signal. Um, so I, I think that uh, you need to take that with a grain of salt, but at least there's not great reason for optimism at this point in terms of um, a break in the drought during early August. And then finally, the last thing I want to do is just make a recruiting pitch like I did last time I spoke, and that is that we need more condition reports. We need more reports from around the state of what the drought is looking like, uh, where you are. And um, this can be done through the Condition Monitoring Observer Reports through the Drought Center. Uh, if you go to the Seymour website, you can sign up and give a report. This is a sample report that I took from Douglas County in early June, a uh, subjective report of how wet or dry it was. Uh, most recently was like this in 2021 and so forth. These are really useful for coming up with a, the most accurate drought monitor map that we can in Wisconsin. And then the last point, the uh, Coco Ross, if you're in the uh, citizen precipitation monitoring program, you can also do these condition reports in a very similar format. So either way, it's helpful for the folks putting together the drought monitor map. And I'm a state climatologist. Um, I help to provide feedback for that. So it's especially nice to see detailed reports on the ground. And then I'll end with this slide, just some drought resources. This um, all-in-one from drought.gov gives you a lot of information in a short amount of time. Wisconsin State Climatology Office, the U USDA NAS statistics that come out for crop conditions every Monday, and then the Seymour and Coco Ross Network monitoring reports. So I will stop there and um, happy to take any questions people might have. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Vavris. Um, I am curious about the um, about the stream flow thing because I have been noticing that as well. And um, I kayak quite a bit, and there is not water in the river, so I don't know why they think that there's water in the river. So, um, and I'm even I look at the USGS data, um, and there's a lot of sites around here that aren't being reported. So, how does how does that site choose which um, stream monitoring sites get put in that map? Do you know? That's a good question. I need to learn more about that. I do know it can be somewhat misleading, that green area of normal. I think that goes from about 30% of normal to 70% of normal. So if you're in the low 30s, you're actually pretty dry, but it still shows up as green. So I think there may be some of that. But if you look carefully at that map, there are also some light blues around, which means above normal, which is shocking. Um, I, too, have noticed that in places I live in Beloit, the Rock River is noticeably lower, not, not like 2012, but it's it's noticeable. And, and so it is puzzling why we don't see more reports or you know data that's showing low stream flow around the state. Maybe people on the call have some insights. But I did look at a similar map from drop.gov for Illinois about a month ago, and it was bright red. <laughs> There's no doubt that they were showing hydrological drought, but in Wisconsin, according to that map, at least, we're not seeing it. Oh. All right. Any other questions for our climatologist? So the Coco Ross reports, do those get taken into account by the those who draw the drought map or? Yes, exactly. So um there's, there's, they both go into their separate databases, but there's also, I think in drought.gov, there's a, a map that combines the two. And I like to look at those. So that way it's just one shop, one stop shopping for me to, to get a sense of uh, around the state, both the Coco Ross and the Seymour report. So either one people want to do, they're both helpful and they have similar types of, uh, you know, rating options and survey questions. All right, thank you so much. Um, if we have any other questions come in, um, we will be sure to address those. There's been some great discussion about mixes of forages and fall forages in the chat. So uh, that will all get saved and we will compile that information. And so now we are going to um, transition over to more of a now what situation. Um, 
Oh, comment from Anne about wondering if the USGS gauge system is geared towards flood, not drought. Uh, the Water Action Volunteer Program in Wisconsin collects weightable stream flow on water, smaller streams. All right, thank you, Anne. Um, so we're gonna talk more about the now what. So for those of you who are in uh, extreme drought or near extreme or in a contiguous county, there are now some uh, disaster assistance programs available. So we have John Palmer from the Farm Service Agency of the USDA here to give us a very quick overview about drought assistance programs. Um, we have been meeting with, uh, with uh, the USDA folks about this. And so um, if you reach out to your regional educator um, and your farm service agency personnel if you have further questions, but I'm sure we'll be able to have some great discussion about this today. So with that, I will turn it over to John. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. Um, I will try to be quick. You know, I get long-winded, so I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, like Natasha said, I'm I'm here to talk today a little bit about some of the farm service agency uh, programs that are available or activated uh, due to our current drought status. Uh, I'm going to start here today, where we've seen this a few times. Uh, the screenshot of the U.S. Drought Monitor. And what I wanted to first talk about is what that means to USDA and the Farm Service Agency um, when we see certain triggers. So on the left, we have the US Drought Monitor, and you can see the areas that have the red, which is our D3 extreme drought, and then the areas that are kind of a, a brown color for the D2 severe drought. Uh, USDA monitors the U.S. Drought Monitor every week when it's issued on Thursdays. And if a county hits extreme drought, such as what we have right now, that is an automatic or pretty much automatic Secretary of Agriculture uh, fast track drought designation. Um, the same thing would happen if these areas in a D2 drought would be in that in that D2 drought for at least eight consecutive weeks during the grazing season. Um, and so when that drought, uh, when it hits those triggers, the drought or the Secretary of Agriculture moves forward with a disaster designation. And that designation activates a number of FSA programs uh, that might be available for assistance. The primary programs that are impacted by the U.S. Drought Monitor, we have the CRP emergency haying and grazing, emergency loans, uh, we have our emergency assistance for livestock, honeybees, and farm-raised fish. That's a mouthful, but we call it ELAP. And then the last program that we have is a livestock forage disaster program. Uh, I'm going to go through a little bit on each one of these, and I'm not going to read right from the slide because I don't want to bore you uh, with that, but with the Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP, a uh, little background is that a CRP participant could pay and graze their CRP acreage in a normal non-disaster year, but there are some limitations that they could only do that once every three years, there would be a payment reduction. So they'd receive a 25% payment reduction uh, for participating in haying and grazing. In a year like this, where we've seen many counties that hit the D2 designation as far as drought severity or higher, uh, then the Farm Service Agency authorizes emergency haying and grazing. And what's important there is that that time clock of once every three years to hay or graze the CRP is, is kind of null and void. Um, those individuals could hay or graze 100% of the acreage that year without regard to what they've done in the prior years. Uh, there is an exception that comes into play and that's when we're in extreme drought. So, and we're gonna look at that on the next slide. I got a map that shows the different areas, but if we're in extreme drought, which many counties are, they would be restricted to haying no more than 50% of the acreage, okay? 
Some of the nice benefit here is also that there is no payment reduction. So the CRP participant isn't harmed by haying and grazing the CRP. They would get their full annual rental payment. Um, some restrictions, the haying cannot start until after our primary nesting season ends. And here in Wisconsin, that primary nesting season ends on August 1st, which is right around the corner. Uh, that would be next week, Tuesday. And so the earliest that the haying could occur would be August 2nd. But to get to that, uh, a producer who's interested in emergency haying and grazing first needs to contact their local FSA office and request approval. As part of that process, uh, they will have to develop a modified conservation plan that gives guidelines as far as the haying and or grazing. Um, that'll go through our conservation partners. Um, and then our local county committee would need to approve uh, that request. Once it's approved, then they can start the activities. Um, an, a, Important piece here, if you are someone who is not a CRP participant, but know of someone who is, that CRP participant could authorize a third party to hay or graze um, that CRP. So livestock producers may have that opportunity to graze some CRP that's not necessarily theirs. And the same thing with those producers who need harvested forage. The next slide here, as far as our map, these areas that are uh, kind of a pink or reddish color, those are what the counties that are currently in the extreme drought status. And so therefore the haying would be limited to 50% of the acreage if the CRP is located in those counties. Uh, this kind of brown shade, those counties are currently in, or at least a portion of that county is in a D2 drought, but hasn't triggered as emergency or um, extreme yet. So the CRP acreage in those counties could, they could hay 100% or graze 100% of that acreage. Um, the next topic is emergency loans, and I'm in no way the, the specialist for emergency loans, but the designation um, for the disaster designations issued by the secretary will identify both primary counties, so those that are in that extreme drought, but it also will designate all of the counties that share a border with them. And producers in those counties would be eligible for emergency loans. Uh, the thing that maybe holds things up here is that the emergency loan is going to be based on that producer having a 30% crop loss. And we won't always know that until closer to harvest time. Okay. Um, now, once a producers, we figure out that they're eligible, they, if they just have to be eligible on one crop, and then the loan could cover other crops that don't hit that trigger of 30%. Um, when looking at that production loss, we're gonna compare what the producer, their harvest or their production this year compared to their own production history. Or if we have some state and county averages, we could compare it to that to see if they hit the 30%. Um, generally, those loans can be used for a number of things. You know, we have operating expenses that they could cover if they need to reestablish crops, maybe they want to refinance certain debts. So there's some flexibility on what those loans uh, can be used for. And we've got some of the limits here too. It's uh, up to $500,000 and we have a seven year term with a really, um, a pretty low interest rate. It can't exceed 3.75. Um, Similar to CRP, that first step is really for a, an individual who's interested in a loan is to contact your local FSA office. If there's nobody in that office who um, 
handles loans, they will get you in touch with somebody from a neighboring office that can help you. Uh, other actions a producer could do is start collecting their production records for the current year. And then we have to look at the, the three-year history, okay? Emergency loans, when we look at the map um, for emergency loans, it's different than the CRP emergency hanging and grazing because we include all of those contiguous counties. We'll look at the North for an example, Douglas, Bayfield and Ashland are primary uh, disaster declaration counties. And then Iron, Price, Sawyer, Washburn and Burnett are what we call contiguous. So if the producer's in any one of those eight counties, they could be eligible for emergency loans. Um, now we're transitioning more into my wheeled house. Uh, I work with our livestock disaster programs and we've got two programs. We have the ELAP program and LFP. Uh, starting with ELAP, uh, that program is only for producers with grazing livestock, okay? So that's a kind of a prerequisite here. And they, they, we need the, the drought designation. There's three different types of things that we will reimburse producers for or make payments for. And that is transporting water to livestock, uh, transporting feed above normal to livestock. And then uh, if the livestock are on grazing acreage and we need the producer needs to move the livestock to an alternative grazing site or maybe even to a feed lot so that they have feed for those animals, uh, FSA could provide um, compensation in those specific situations as well. Um, in true FSA fashion, I've got a lot of details here, but the big thing that we have with ELAP is that you really need to document um, what all expense you're incurring. And so if you're hauling water, we need to know how much that costs to haul the water and also how many gallons of water are transported. Um, really important piece is a notice of loss is always required within 30 days of when it's apparent. So if you started hauling water today, you have 30 days to file a notice of loss with our, with our offices. And we're pretty lenient on that. They don't need to be signed. You just have to make a contact. So phone, fax, or email works. On the feed transportation, um, it would be tracking the number of miles that you haul the feed. So if you haul 10 loads and each load has to go 200 miles, then you've got 2,000 miles. Um, our reimbursement for that is about $6.60 per loaded mile. So it's not the trip to pick up the feed, it's the trip back with a load of feed. Um, we also need to know what you would normally, um, the normal year mileage for transporting feed. So if you normally haul 10 loads of feed, but each one is only 50 miles, uh, then we would deduct that out from the payment amount. Uh, same thing applies here as far as notices of losses. As soon as you know, you're gonna have to haul additional feed or haul that feed additional mileage, then a producer should file a notice of loss with our offices. Uh, I don't wanna forget about honeybees. Um, with honeybees, we cover a number of perils under our ELAP program. Uh, the table here at the top is to show really that the only one where we cover losses due to drought is if the, the honeybee uh, producer re is required to purchase more feed than normal because of drought. And when we do that, it, um, we're going to look at the current year versus the prior two years to see that increased expense. Um, as far as actions for a honeybee producer, again, we have a notice of loss. Uh, their honeybee producers have a, a tighter window. It has to be within 15 days of when that loss is apparent. Um, another major requirement is that 
that producer reports all of their colonies to the Farm Service Agency. And uh, actions that those producers can take now would be to assemble their receipts for all of their extra feed that they purchase. The last program that I'm gonna cover here today um, is the Livestock Forage Disaster Program or LFP. It's another program that is primarily for uh, producers of grazing livestock. Uh, individuals need to either own cash lease or contract grow grazing animals. They also need to have control and risk in grazed forage, okay? And the last thing is that grazed forage needs to be physically located in a county that reached our disaster designation, okay? Um, key components here is that we need an acreage report on file with the Farm Service Agency. And that's the very first step. Without that, there's no application. Our software requires an acreage report to be on file uh, for the grazing acreage. Um, things for producers to do right now is to uh, start collecting your livestock inventory, um, what type of animals you have and the weight ranges that those animals fall into. If, if a producer leases uh, grazing acreage, they should also be putting together their leases and preparing those to submit to FSA. And then the last step is, is to um, you know, contact our Farm Service Agency office so that they can help you walk through the application process. Um, I think we're almost there, folks. The last map I have here is, is for the Livestock Forage Program and ELAP. And the areas in yellow are our currently eligible counties based on they reach that D3 drought designation. So they're in the extreme drought area. Um, and that's where those livestock and the grazing acres would need to be uh, located. These maps, they're constantly evolving. So if the D3 area expands or if D2 hits eight consecutive weeks, the map will change. Uh, the last slide I had here is um, I got my contact information there. And you know, of course, if you have questions, but I also have a link to our service center locator, which if you're someone who hasn't participated with the Farm Service Agency in the past, you might not know where to go. That link um, can get you lined up with your local service center where somebody's available to help you. All right. Thank you so much, John. Um... And I'm sure that we will all be learning more about these programs as things progress, unfortunately. Um, a, one question is uh, that I have is, is there a way to track how many weeks um, a D2 county has been D2? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. And I think I'm, we've been trying to pull reports here at FSA to track that ourselves, that ourselves but, um, okay. I got, I got to think about that a little. I'll have to look at the drought monitor and see. Um, FSA yeah. does track when it, a county triggers, um, and we've been able to pull the data and line it all up to see, but I need to look at the drought monitor to give you a firm answer, Natasha. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, before we move to our final speaker, um, I'm going to uh, launch our poll for today. If you would please provide us some feedback on how you felt about today's webinar. Our final speaker will be about uh, pest and disease management in a drought situation. And I want to thank all of our speakers once again uh, for joining us. I want to thank all of you for taking time out this morning. And we will be providing um, as, much, as, as many resources to follow up as possible. Um, I also want to take just a moment while people are filling out the poll to introduce uh, Scott Newell. He is our new uh, alfalfa outreach specialist. And um, so if you work in the, uh, if you raise alfalfa um, and work in the forage space, I just wanted to let you know that we do have a new person on staff uh, specifically devoted to alfalfa. 
So with that, um, and trying to be respectful of everyone's time, um, I am going to transfer over to Josh and uh, let him talk to us about uh, pest management for this uh, special time we're in. Thank you, Josh. You bet. Thank you, Natasha. And just maybe a quick reassurance that the slide is coming through. Yeah, you're good. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone, for sticking with us today. And thank you so much for the presenters that that already shared. Uh, that was some excellent information and really I definitely worked together with the messages throughout the program today. Uh, so we're going to share just a little bit of information from our uh, pest management departments at UW-Madison. Um, so Damon Smith on the uh, disease side, the pathology side, uh, Dr. Uh, Emily Bick on the entomology, and Dr. Rodrigo Worley um, with field crop uh, weed, um, weed control work. All right, so what I have up here in front of us is a, a, corn, a corn root. Um, still, we're still in a good time if we want to get out and do some examination of some of our corn fields, maybe the corn on corn acres that we have on our, on our farms. We want to try to, you know, get that, get that root mass out of the ground as, uh, kind of less, uh, you know, injury as possible and wash that soil off. Um, Iowa State has some really good information on how to, how to score those roots, um, or definitely reach out to one of your regional educators as well. Um, there's some information that we have that we can help you out. What that tells us is how much larval damage was there um, on our corn crop this year. So that corn rootworm larva will hatch in the spring and that, and that uh, larva is what does most of the damage on that corn plant. Um, we also wanna be doing some adult beetle counts in our, in our fields. Um, we can use sticky traps, we can go to the fields and try to actually count on the plants. So all those thresholds are available. Uh, for that, for controlling and man managing that that pest. All right, so just a little bit about diseases, some things to keep in mind. Um, there are some pr prediction tools, and I'm going to show just a couple of slides on those. Um, what are our scouting practices? So really having uh, an idea on how that disease develops, what are the situations that that disease likes to thrive in. Um, that's really going to dictate, you know, how we go ahead and scout for that in the field. Um, and then the timing of control measures. Uh, so, you know, when these, some of these pathogens develop into a disease in our, in our, in our crops, you know, at what point uh, do we want to go ahead and try to control that um, outbreak uh, to try to maximize the, uh, you know, the quality and the the yield that um, we have going on in our in our in our fields so just have a picture of a tar spot um, there on a corn leaf that actually is not taken this year um, to my knowledge we have not confirmed that uh, pathogen yet in the state um, and to the right side um, there is a a, a root disease there on, on a soybean plant so here's a couple of those for prediction tools um, if you want to try those out, they're both they're both free um, through the um, insect and pest management program, uh, UW or U, U, UW Madison. So the tar spotter tool, and then the spore caster tool. So one's for tar spot with corn, and one is for white mold uh, forecasting in soybean. Uh, so go ahead and check those out. You'll be able to enter a field location. And then you'll be able to get, receive a report as far as, you know, what is the risk that we might have for development of these diseases in our, in our fields. Okay, next, just a little bit about insects. Um, we had some conversation earlier about, you know, trying to get an idea of what is that pest level in our, in our fields compared to the beneficial insects in our, in our fields. Um, so I have kind of a mixture of both here um, as pictures on this screen. And we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, one tool, though, that is really helpful, um, De Department of Ag in Wisconsin has a trapping network. Uh, so you can um, sub subscribe to that list, to the field notes list, uh, and you'll get that report once per week. If you want to get involved, uh, reach out um, to DACAP, reach out to one of your regional ed educators. We do, we do have a trapping network in the south part of the state uh, where we're trying to evaluate this true armyworm. 
Um, that is the ins or that is the pest on the far right side. We had some some pretty sub substantial damage this spring, so we're trying to get an idea on what is the population or the risk uh, for the second generation. So we're currently uh, running that moth trapping network across the southern part of the state, and then ultimately, what is the threshold le level? Um, just because we have a, a creepy crawly pest in the field uh, does not mean you know we need to maybe come through with some type of control measure. Okay, so maybe you've had a chance to uh, just view some of those pictures while I shared. Um, the far left is actually our beneficial insect of these three. Um, so that is the pupae stage of the lady beetle. Uh, in the middle, those are corn rootworm larvae. So they're kind of getting towards their mature size and they're gonna actually pupate themselves and become that adult corn rootworm beetle. And of course the true army worm larva on the far right. Okay, here's just a couple of glimpses of, of some tools that are available. Um, that field notes program is one you can subscribe to. The Wisconsin Crop Manager is another program you can subscribe to. You'll, be, you'll receive weekly updates about what's going on in the fields. And then to take that deeper dive, we do have a pest management uh, in Wisconsin field crops. So that'll cover diseases, insects, and weeds uh, with some control data, um, some different product data, and then also that threshold information. Okay, finally, finish up with, with weeds. Uh, what we need to be thinking about right now is identifying and documenting any weed populations in our fields. Um, that'll help us when it comes time for harvest. Oftentimes these weed plants, as they mature, they will dry down and be a little bit more difficult to find in the field. Um, and the goal then is to limit the seed pr production from these weeds and then really reduce that seed spread either across the field that they're in or across the larger area um, in mul multiple fields on our farm. Uh, so these are different pigweed plants. There's actually only two species here. Uh, the far left is a water hemp plant. Um, I actually parked my car along the street. Uh, here by the office and I and I looked out and I saw a water hemp plant. So um, it found a little crevice and some water and that's where it decided to grow. Um, in the middle is a water hemp plant that um, had been fairly recently sprayed with uh, dike, 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 dicamba uh, kind of towards the end of that, you know, spraying season. Um, so I'll, I'll be interested if that plant is going to try to grow back. It looks like it maybe is. And the far right is a pigweed that we're finding in the, the southern part of the state and even some more remote lo locations across Wisconsin, and that is Palmer amaranth. Okay, so that's a pigweed species that we really are keeping our eye on. Um, really need the help from everyone that's out there in the fields. If you see something that looks like pigweed but, but doesn't, um, there's a chance it could be this Palmer amaranth species of pigweed. Uh, so I guess one of the key uh, identification measures of Palmer amaranth, if you can see in that picture, the really long petiole. So from the point of the stem out to the base of the leaf, um, that petiole will be longer than the leaf blade itself. Okay, and then it all, it's similar to water hemp where it doesn't have um, any hairs on the stem. So please reach out if you see something that you don't know for sure what it, what it is. Um, we can definitely uh, get out to the field and get that identified and try to make up a plan to control it. Okay, a little bit about weed seed management, and I won't take too much more time, um, but we think about that harvest timing as a really good opportunity to, you know, keep any uh, escaped weeds, keep their seeds in the field that we're harvesting in. Okay, so there's kind of a step-by-step uh, effort here that University of Nebraska, along with UW-Madison, has put, put together, um, kind of starting first with cleaning out that auger, um, you know, making sure that is, that is free and clean before we move to the next field, um, then working on that head in the feeder house, maybe even snapping the head off so we can clean that off really good, um, and then going to that grain transfer area of the combine, and then finally cleaning out in the back. Um, the work that the whisk, leads, the whisk weeds lab did, uh, we can oftentimes in about 20 to 30 minutes, uh, clean these five lo locations in the combine and reduce the amount of weed seeds that we have close to 80%. Okay, so it's, it's kind of a quick process. If we have a field that we know has some weeds that escaped, uh, let's go ahead and try to uh, 
uh, use a little bit of time to, to clean that out before we move to that next field. And uh, there is a video um, on the bottom there that uh, Kevin Jarek, um, an egg educator in the northeast part of the state, and uh, Dan Smith, a specialist here in the southwest region, uh, put, put together for that really complete and thorough uh, combine cleaning uh, as, a, as a way to keep those weed seeds from spreading. Um, and also I put up the nutrient management guidelines for Wisconsin too, uh, thinking about the competitiveness of our crop that's growing in the field. We really want to use that to our advantage as well. So uh, that document there that I have um, just a screenshot of, that is the basis for all of our nutrient management planning software. Um, and that's updated as new research comes. So if you don't have one of those and, and you're curious, you know, what are my soil fertility levels? Um, and what kind of nu nutrients, you know, is recommended through UW research, um, go ahead and reach out to your land conservation office or your local extension office. Oftentimes there's a few copies of these available. Um, they're really interesting so we can dial in our crop for fertility planning. Um, also for, for, for yield um, and profitability, but then also for some of this weed management by promoting that competitive crop. Uh, just one more slide, um, some work out of University of Arkansas that I, that I borrowed. Uh, year one is on the left where there's a Palmer amaranth population. Uh, year two is on the right where there weren't any measures taken to remove those plants from the field before harvest. Um, and the pace to which those plants spread is just tremendous. Um, and then we talked a little bit about, you know, how to remove, uh, you know, a, a large portion of the seeds by about 20 to 30 minutes through the combine. Um, here's a few of those locations through that research where the seeds were found um, and we were able to remove those seeds through that combine cleaning. Uh, one more re resource, the UW uh, Pest Management Fast Facts. Um, if you go to that IPCM location, so Integrated Pest and Crop Management, you'll be able to find this. Um, or again, reach out to a local extension office if you'd like a copy. Uh, this is a kind of a quick and easy uh, couple-sided couple document that can really help with some of those infield pest management decisions. Um, and I do have a couple of weeds to, to share that I'd like everyone to acquaint themselves with, especially if you're towards the southern part of the state. On the left, um, we have poison hemlock. Um, and I don't have a picture that's very zoomed in here, but it'll have some purple blotches on the stem and it has that kind of flat topped umbral seed head. So it is part of the carrot family. Um, this plant is, is um, all flowered and seed and seed is there by now. So we really can't control this plant at this point in the year. I just wanna bring it to everyone's attention that this is a very poisonous plant. Um, so just use some extreme caution when you're out there trying to control it. Um, be careful you're not breathing in any of the dust or the particles from maybe doing like 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 a mowing pass. And then let's let's find some ways to manage this this so it doesn't spread anymore across some of our riparian and some of our pasture areas. And then on the far right, um, that is hill mustard. Um, that is a plant that that I'm seeing more and more in some of the riparian areas, some of the um, uh, some of the highway right of ways and such across the southern part of the state. Uh, so that's a mustard plant that um, can act like a perennial, actually. Um, has some distinct black bumps on the stem, um, but also a plant that it, it's, way, it's way past time to control it for this year. Um, but one of those plants to kind of keep an eye on, um, let's try to get maybe a mowing or a herbicide treatment down for that so we can keep that from spreading as well. And with that, I am, I'm done. So I'll turn it back to Natasha. Um, just a thank you to um, the, three, the three labs that helped with the information today. Uh, so Dr. Damon Smith with the Badger Crop Doc Lab, Dr. Rodrigo Worley with the Cropping Systems Weed Science Lab, and Dr. Emily Bick with the Entomology Lab. All right, thank you so much, Josh. Um, and we have um, we have a couple uh, quick things to do here at the end. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, a quick plug for anyone who would like to attend Manure Expo. That is coming up 9th, the August 9th and 10th at the Arlington Blaine Dairy Facility. So uh, it's a great 
Uh, it's a great time to learn about nutrient management and precision and manure. And there are CCA credits available. It is free unless you would like to participate in a tour. Okay, today, if you would like to earn CCA credits, there was um, a, a Qualtrics link put in the chat. Otherwise, you can use the code here to uh, put in your CCA app. And with that, I want to thank everyone very much for their time today. I hope it was valuable. I want to thank all of our speakers. I want to thank the planning team uh, behind this, uh, which was uh, myself, Josh Camps, uh, Chris Clark, and Sam Bibby, and our manager, Ann Pfeiffer. So with that, um, and the rest of our entire uh, Crops and Soils team, and I hope you have a great weekend, and I hope we get some rain and we don't have to do this again. Um, our next uh, Badger Crop Connect will be on August 23rd. Uh, we'll be talking about corn silage harvest. So thank you very much for, for your attendance today. And if you have further questions, I know some of our specialists are still on the call. And so you can feel free to stick around and have a little chat with us um, for a few minutes. So thank you very much and have a great weekend. So uh, team, I won't have a lot of time today to work on compiling things, but would be more than willing to help similar to last time. Um, and I think I'll get the chat. I got the chat once. I had to log out. My computer screen was doing something funky. So I got like the first half of the chat that 